Indonesia is steeped in spirituality, a place where people worship God in many different ways. Along with this rich diversity, it is also home to the world's largest Muslim population. A truth I came to know as a boy when I heard the call to prayer across Jakarta. But we also know that relations between the United States and Muslim communities have frayed over many years. As president, I've made it a priority to begin to repair these relations. As part of that effort, I went to Cairo last June, and I called for a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world, one that creates a path for us to move beyond our differences. I said then, and I will repeat now, that no single speech can eradicate years of mistrust. But I believe then, and I believe today, that we do have a choice. We can choose to be defined by our differences and give in to a future of suspicion and mistrust. Or we can choose to do the hard work of forging common ground and commit ourselves to the steady pursuit of progress. And I can promise you, no matter what setbacks may come, the United States is committed to human progress. Many other Americans have Muslims in their families or have lived in a Muslim-majority country. I know because I am one of them. As a boy, I spent several years in Indonesia and heard the call of the Azan at the break of dawn. Well, I have known Islam on three continents before coming to the region where it was first revealed. That experience guides my conviction. You, you are absolutely right that John McCain has not uh, talked about my Muslim faith. As the Holy Quran tells us, the Holy Quran teaches that, the Holy Quran tells us, and the Holy Quran also says, we will convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world. I would like to speak directly to the people and leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Your great and celebrated culture. Over many centuries, your art, your music, literature, and innovation have made the world a better and more beautiful place. We know that you are a great civilization, and your accomplishments have earned the respect of the United States and the world. I also know civilization's debt to Islam. It was Islam at places like Uluzan, that carried the light of learning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's renaissance and enlightenment. It was innovation in Muslim communities that developed the order of algebra, our magnetic compass and tools of navigation, our mastery of pens and printing, our understanding of how disease spreads and how it can be healed. Islamic culture has given us majestic arches and soaring spires, timeless poetry and cherished music, elegant calligraphy, and places of peaceful com contemplation. They have fought in our wars, they have served in our government, they have stood for civil rights, they have started businesses, they have taught at our universities, they have excelled in our sports arenas, they have won Nobel Prizes, built our tallest building, and lit the Olympic torch. And when the first Muslim American was recently elected to Congress, he took the oath to defend our Constitution using the same Holy Quran in ancient times and in our times, Muslim communities have been at the forefront of innovation and education. Islam is not part of the problem in combating violent extremism. It is an important part of promoting peace. The enduring faith of over a billion people is so much bigger than the narrow hatred of a few. In the United States, rules on charitable giving have made it harder for Muslims to fulfill their religious obligation. That's why I'm committed to working with American Muslims to ensure that they can fulfill Saka. It is important for Western countries to avoid impeding Muslim citizens from practicing religion as they see fit. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. We are no longer a Christian nation. We do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. The United States has been enriched by Muslim Americans. Islam has always been a part of America's story. There is a mosque in every state in our union and over 1,200 mosques within our borders. 
you know, one of the points I want to make is, is that if you actually took the number of Muslims, Americans, uh, you know, we'd be one of the largest Muslim countries in the world. Let there be no doubt, Islam is a part of America. He did bow to the Muslim king, while he did not do it to the British Queen of England. And by bowing, he showed the world that I am subservient. I do owe, uh, bow down to you as a Muslim king, something no other uh, president has done with Saudi Arabia. The Saudi king is his peer. He is not his subordinate in order to bow for him. And this is exactly what Obama did. Usually it is out of respect that someone would nod his head when bowing to royalty and the ladies will give curtsy. But Obama went beyond what is required as a head of state and bowed to the Saudi king and that's unacceptable. Right, it sent the wrong symbol. What, when you say it's saying it sends the wrong signal, what signal do you think it sends? It sent a message that Islam is superior to any other master or king or president in the world. That an American president bound to a Muslim king. It also sent a message that terrorism and jihadism is giving Islam the respect it, it should have on the world stage to the point that it made an American president for the first time in history bow to a Muslim king. It's a little weird, Alan, that in the middle of the campaign the guy takes off the American flag that most people wear because they're proud of their country. Uh, I won't wear that uh, pin on my chest. Let me speak as clearly and as plainly as I can. America is not and never will be at war with Islam. Imruz sarasari Iran Islami as Junub ta Shemar va Shar ta Gab yek faryad as laun mark bar Amerika. نفرت و خشم ملت مسلمان بر امریکا و رژیم کفر شیطان بر امریکا و رژیم کفر شیطان امریکا و رژیم شاخ شکسته امریکا و رژیم شاخ شکسته در انتظار رابطه نشسته رابطه با امریکا نمیشه رابطه با امریکا نمیشه نبرد ما با امریکا همیشه نبرد ما فریاد انسان های روی زمین فریاد انسان های روی زمین فریاد انسان های روی زمین مرد بر امریکا پرید نعیم We see faith driving us to do right We see ISIL a brutal, vicious death cult that in the name of religion carries out unspeakable acts of barbarism. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. Terrorizing religious minorities like the Yazidis. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces Subjecting women to rape is a weapon of war. Speeding up training of ISIL forces and claiming the mantle of religious authority for such actions. Perpetrated in the name of religion. Let me speak as clearly and as plainly as I can. America is not and never will be at war with Islam. And lest we get on our high horse and think this is unique to some other place, remember that during the Crusades and the Inquisition, people committed terrible deeds in the name of Christ. In our home country, slavery and Jim Crow all too often was justified in the name of Christ.
Michelle and I returned from India, an incredible, beautiful country full of this magnificent diversity, but a place where in past years religious faiths of all types have on occasion been targeted by other peoples of faith simply due to their heritage and their beliefs. Acts of intolerance that would have shocked Gandhiji, the person who helped to liberate that nation. So this is not unique to one group or one religion. There is a tendency in us, a sinful tendency that can pervert and distort our faith. Thank you. And Ed A. Shaman Mubarak. Where we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. Where we are no longer. Where we are no longer a Christian nation. Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay, and that eating uh, shellfish is an abomination? Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical. In my first term, we ended the war in Iraq. In my second term, I will win the war on Christmas. So before we get carried away, let's read our Bibles now. Folks haven't been reading the Bible. Now, I may be opposed to a for religious reasons, to take one example, but if I seek to pass a law banning the practice, I can't simply point to the teachings of my church or evoke God's will. I can't simply evoke God's will. I have to explain why abortion violates some principle that is accessible to people of all faiths, including those with no faith at all. Now this is, is going to be difficult for some who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, as many evangelicals do. But in a pluralistic society, we have no choice. Politics depends on our ability to persuade each other of common aims based on a common reality. It involves compromise, the art of what's possible. And at some fundamental level, religion doesn't allow for compromise. It's the art of the impossible. If God's spoken, then followers are expected to live up to God's edicts, regardless of the consequences. Now, to base one's own life on such uncompromising commitments may be sublime, but to base our policy making on such commitments would be a dangerous thing. I think I understand how Abraham Lincoln felt when he said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. Now I realize it's fashionable in some circles to believe that no one in government should encourage others to read the Bible. That we're, we're told that we'll violate the constitutional separation of church and state established by the founding fathers in the First Amendment. The First Amendment was not written to protect people and their laws from religious values. It was written to protect those values from government tyranny. I've said that we must be cautious in claiming God is on our side. I think the real question we must answer is, are we on his side? We have a promise that can make all the difference. A promise from Jesus to soothe our sorrows, heal our hearts, and drive away our fears. He promised there will never be a dark night that does not end. Our weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. He promised if our hearts are true, his love will be as sure as sunlight. And by dying for us, Jesus showed how far our love should be ready to go. All the way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Which passages of scripture 
should guide our public policy. Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay, and that eating uh, shellfish is an abomination? Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith? Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application? We... So before we get carried away, let's read our Bibles now. Folks haven't been reading their Bibles. The White House asked for all symbols to be covered at the lecture hall. A university spokeswoman tells Cybercast News, quote, the White House wanted a simple backdrop consistent with, with what they've done for other policy speeches. The monogram, IHS, which comes from the Greek for Jesus, was covered with a triangle of black painted plywood. The audacity of the Obama administration to ask a religious school to neuter itself before the president speaks there. Uh, that there are not tensions, inevitable tensions, uh, between cultures which I think is extraordinarily important. That's something that's very important to me. You know, I've said before uh, that one of the great strengths of the United States is, uh, although as I mentioned, uh, you know, we have a very large Christian population, we do not consider ourselves a Christian nation or a Jewish nation or a Muslim nation. Uh, we consider ourselves uh, a nation of citizens.
have a very large Christian population. We do not consider ourselves a Christian nation or a Jewish nation or a Muslim nation. Uh, we consider ourselves uh, a nation of citizens. Uh, and yet, uh, what we're seeing is in both countries uh, that promise of a secular country. We are no longer a Christian nation. We do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. The United States has been enriched by Muslim Americans. Islam has always been a part of America's story. There is a mosque in every state in our union and over 1,200 mosques within our borders. Let there be no doubt, Islam is a part of America.